Hello everyone. On today's tutorial, we're going to be looking at the NVU as well as the KLN90 for the Tupolev 154M by Felis for X-Plane. Uh, we're going to be traveling from Manchester, New Hampshire today up to Bangor, Maine. It's a relatively quick flight, usually takes about a half an hour on a bad day, but uh, the weather, as you can see, is a little rough, so it might make our approach a little more exciting than usual. Anyway, let's go ahead and get started. Now, um, what I've done is I've gotten the plane all set up and everything ready to go. All the gyros have been synchronized. Everything is pretty much set, with the exception of those two systems. Now, without getting into too much crazy detail, I'm going to attempt to explain roughly how I use them, and as well as how you may use them as well. Now, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be traveling. Let me go ahead and call up my little map right here. Just like I said, leaving Manchester, we're going to be flying the P port departures procedure. We're actually going to use the NVU to help us with this. We're going to be flying a modified version. Instead of going south, we're actually going to be going north, but that's okay. We're going to be flying that, traveling directly up north, and then using the high LS approach directly into Bangor, Maine itself. Now, we're going to be using the KLN90 to get us to this position to make things a little bit easier. For those of you who are not sure, an, a high LS approach, or high ILS approach, is a special approach where we come in at an extremely high altitude and basically fly straight in using a lot of speed brakes and flaps. So that should be a pretty exciting way to kind of dip through the clouds because the weather, again, is not particularly good there. Anyway, let's go ahead and take a look at the NVU first. Now, uh, people who have seen my uh, NCNS tutorial are probably a little bit familiar with this unit. This is just a more user-friendly version of it. I'm going to go ahead and pause real quick so you guys can see it. So there's basically two parts to the system. There's the integrator calculator system and then there's the actual Doppler radar. The way that this system works is it measures the Doppler shift of a radar signal that's bounced off the ground to determine how fast you're traveling. It simply takes that information integrates it and then calculates where you're going, where you've been, things along those, and provides you with heading information to the roll channel of the automatic pilot. In order for the system to work properly, there's a couple of things you have to keep in mind. The first one is you have to make sure you turn it on. So if we were to actually go to the overhead panel real quick, you'll see this guy, this is Doppler Nav right up here. You want to go ahead and click this switch. Now this one that says ground and sea is very important because it tells you how to compensate for the different terrains you might be flying over. Um, when you're flying over anything that's hard and bumpy, generally you want to click to ground. If you're flying anything extremely flat, especially oceans, you want to flip that to C. It basically boosts your estimated true airspeed a little bit in order to get you a slightly better um, calculation. Now if we cruise over here, you have this thing that says NAV, NVU by DOP, by TAS, and in-flight test. You can actually tell the NVU system what your true airspeed is and you can actually tell it what your wind is to make it do calculations on its own. But uh, since we have a working Doppler radar, we might as well use it as well. It is very important if you travel over water to hit this switch, otherwise you will accumulate a large amount of error as you're traveling. So anyway, that's the Doppler unit. Let's go ahead and take a look at the actual calculator unit down here. Now the way this unit works is you have what they call a location, a point, and a beacon. What we're going to do is to set up where we are relative to where we want to be first, including the angle to that point and the distance to that point. So to do that, I'm going to flip down here. I'm going to go ahead and click on the power switch to turn the unit on. You can see everybody lights up. Do not touch this switch, by the way, until we're good to go. So if you remember, we're going to be traveling on the P port 1 departure procedure. So we need to locate Ramy, and then we need to travel directly to P port. So to do this, I've actually loaded them into Sky Vector. Again, this is a beautiful tool. I hope to God they don't start charging for it someday. We're going to be taking off to the south, swinging around, lining up with this and going. So our first heading we're going to be traveling at is 78 degrees at 16 nautical miles. So I'm going to come over to where it says CAS. If it travels a little slow, you can just go ahead and press that middle mouse button. Notice this one is highlighted. This is going to be the one we're presently on. Go ahead and set that to 78 degrees. Perfect. By the way, those are minutes in case you're curious. You can do very accurate calculations if you desire. And then we're going to go ahead and dial in the 16 nautical miles. Now, 16 nautical miles is going to be 29.632. So now we come down here and we have to set this. When you're setting your initial values, you always set this to S. 
S is only basically used initially. By the way, Z is for setting left and right. S is basically forward and backwards, as you'll see in just a second. And now we're going to set a negative value to how far we want to travel. We want to travel 29.632 kilometers. So I'm going to go ahead and hit this button right here. You can see up here in the top left as the number goes down. 29, uh, well, just a little more, right there, perfect. This unit is almost set up. So after we go directly to Rame, I believe we have to travel to Peaport. Now I set this one up well over here. Now this is going to be at 086 for 6 nautical miles. This is going to be a heck of a fast turn. Now this is where you're going to get yourself in trouble right away. If you're still in S mode, you're going to be in trouble. So we're actually going to grab this and set it to SP mode. This allows us to define where we want to be. Once you've gotten yourself in SP mode, you practically don't need to change from it forever again. These modes here on the left are basically reserved for making little corrections. We're not going to worry too, too much about them at this time. So anyway, SP mode is selected. Now we set our new distance, which is going to be six nautical miles. Oh boy, this is going to be maybe too quick. That's 11.112 kilometers. So we're going to go ahead and set this again. Now notice this time, this guy down here is changing. We wanted 11.112, uh, I think it was. 11.112. Right. Now we're ready to use this unit with two exceptions. First of all, you have to actually turn the calculator on. Second of all, we have to tell it how far in advance to execute a turn. Basically, if you're really hauling or you're taking super duper steep turns, you're going to be using 25. But I find for little teeny tiny turns like this, less than 10 degrees at the speed we're going to be traveling, I'm going to click it to 5. If you ever need to overwrite the system, you can actually click it down to manual to cause this 1 to shoot over to the 2 and start recalculating things. You're going to watch a lot of stuff going on in a second once we engage the switch, but I'm going to be waiting until we get over to the runway. By the way, Doppler radars don't like to be tilted excessively, so if you find yourself in a situation where you are tilting the Doppler radar excessively, you're going to get yourself in a little bit of trouble later on. Uh, I'm just setting something up for myself real quick here. Okay, so that's the basic setup for the NVU unit. Once we get to the end of this course, we're actually going to slice and go ahead and dial in the KLN90, which is going to be our next stop. Now, the KLN90, in order for it to operate properly on this particular airplane, you need to make sure it actually has power, which it does. And the other thing you need to do, whoop, we can go ahead and turn that on while I'm just thinking about it. The other thing you need to do is you can either use it as a 3D item in the world or you can click on the center and bring it up. I prefer to use it this way because it's just a little easier to see what I'm doing. It's going to go ahead and uh, do its little self-test and then it's going to ask us for atmospheric pressure. Who cares? Uh, we do. A lot. Because if you set this properly, it's going to be able to give you VNAV information and other useful stuff like that. It just makes your life a lot easier, trust me. So we're going to go ahead and set it. I already set it a little earlier. It's uh, 10, 15 millibars. And I'm going to go ahead and press it. Approve. It's going to say it's expired. Ugh, whatever. By the way, if you ever find yourself in a situation where you need to update this navigational database with explains, all you have to do is go to the settings page and scoot all the way to page to zero. Don't do this often unless you've just updated your data because it will take you a little while to do. It's kind of handy. Anyway, so basically the way this unit works, go ahead and uh, try to make it a little bit bigger so everybody, whoa, wow, can't miss that. The way this unit works is you have a left side and a left screen with its own knob and you have a right side and a right screen with its own knob as well as some kind of quick action buttons on the bottom. The mode you're presently in is down here, and whatever page of that mode is going to be down here. Like you can see right now on the right side we're on airport mode, on the left side we're on status mode. To change between modes, all you have to do is click the double arrow, which hopefully you guys can see. To change between pages, you click the little single arrow either back or forth. That's again the inner knob and the outer knob respectively. So um, just a couple quick little things here. If you guys are curious what the different modes are and the different pages, I'll go through them. The first one, if uh, when you first start up the unit, you're going to be on what they call nav mode. This is the default mode. It will tell you how far away you are from your destination. It'll tell you things like um, your present position, stuff along those. We're getting a flag right now because we haven't actually told it where we want to go yet. This is a very, very useful mode. And it's the most common mode you're being in. We have the cal mode, which is the calculator mode. This is actually kind of neat. If you were, for example, if I press cursor real quick, you can tell it what my indicated altitude is. You can set with the expected, whoop, you can set the expected barometric pressure. 
And then what it would actually do is tell you your pressure altitude. You could even set your uh, temperature. Let's say we're in the middle of Denver in the uh, summer, and it gives you your density altitude. Pretty handy. By the way, I'm pressing the cursor button to activate this guy so that I can move around. Also in the calculator, you can calculate your true airspeed. You can calculate your wind. By the way, when you're traveling, if you don't tell it your true airspeed, it basically gives you your ground speed down here, which is kind of handy. You can calculate VNAV angle. For example, if we know we're doing a three degree descent, we can actually program this in advance and it would tell us exactly when we need to start descending. Kind of handy. We could do a temperature and speed calculation. Unfortunately, it doesn't have kilometers an hour. We could also do time conversion if we needed. We could even calculate when the sunrise and sunset is. And it's all very, very handy stuff. Usually you want to do this while you're sitting on the ground with the GPU running or the APU running to save fuel because I'm just kind of wasting it right now. Your next page, this is your status page. This basically tells you what GPSs it does. It gives you an estimated position error. It also tells you what version of the software, how many, oh boy, how many times you turn the unit on and off gives you status, all things along those lines. I don't find that I ever really need this page. You have your settings. Now, you'll probably notice mine's in kilograms and millibars. Yours may not be by default. That's okay, because if you go to the settings page, you can set the date and time. You could also set what kind of airport length. I could say, for example, my minimum is actually, I want to, uh, whoop. Again, if I want to, there we go. We could define exactly how many feet we want our runway to be. So in this case, let me say it's about, whoo. It doesn't like things bigger than 5,000 feet because it wasn't really designed to be used in an airplane this big. We could also define what kind of surface. We could use hard and soft surfaces. We might as well, right? Go to the next page. This is the flight timer. It's not actually going to kick in until we get rolling. You'll see that in a little while once we get in the air. Height alert. Turn anticipate. I've already enabled it. This is where you can set your units. You can either do inches of mercury or you can do millibars, depending on what you're comfortable with. For this airplane, millibars works better. You can do airspace alerts. You can have it make alerts when you're getting to a specific altitude. You can also set this stuff up. PRI, you can actually set this to be a primary or secondary navigation device. You almost always want that to be on PRI. You can define what HSI is linked to. You can define how long it takes the GPS to actually synchronize with the satellites. You can change your fuel unit if you'd like. Again, I happen to use uh, kilograms here because everything else in the plane is in kilograms. You can also set some VNAV information as well. So again, the settings page is pretty handy. Whenever you do the settings page, you usually only have to do it once. All right. And now probably everybody's favorite page once we get up in the air. That's the other page. If you go to page three, you can actually define specific custom waypoints, which is kind of handy. We can define our own special airports and leave notes on them. And then we get to this page, which is incredibly useful. This tells us how much fuel we have on board, tells us the required fuel once we give it a destination, how much fuel we'll have left, what kind of reserve we'll have. Generally, I set the reserve to zero, but um, depending on what country you're flying and what virtual airline you're with, they may expect you to be using 45 minutes or anything along those lines. Again, I find it's just easier to do the math myself. We can scoot over here. It tells us just sitting here idle, we have 4 hours and 50 minutes worth of fuel on board, as well as other things like range, how many uh, gas mileage, how much reserve time we're going to have. It gives us our fuel flow per hour. Woo! It tells us how much fuel we burnt just sitting here wasting time. It tells us our air data. We actually have a true air speed right now because of the fact there's a little bit of a wind pointing into us. It tells you exactly the details of that right there. Gives us a little bit more information like our true air temperature and our what air temperature the airplane feels based on the heating of the skin. Gives us our density, altitude, things along those lines. So that OTH or other page is really, really handy. Uh, we have trip plan estimates, which is pretty handy. It doesn't really do much for us because um, we haven't defined anything in here. But this is a great way to actually uh, punch in how long your trip is, how much fuel you expect to burn, and it can do a lot of the math for you. I don't think I've ever actually needed to use this page because I do everything externally anyway, but it is pretty handy. We have uh, modify. We're going to leave this alone because we don't want to play this with this too much, but this is basically if we want to fly a specific leg away from something and uh, things along those lines. I don't see myself using this very often, but if you want to play with it a little bit, definitely feel free. We have the flight plan option. This is one of the most important pages, be it or not, on this particular unit. You can see um, basically your flight plans are down here. To define a new flight plan, all we'd have to do is press the cursor button, go here, and then we could define each individual one. We could delete waypoints if we wanted to, anything along those lines. Something you want to know, however,
Flight Plan Zero is the currently loaded flight plan, regardless of how you have things set up. Now, this is the preferred method to use this particular plane. You want to export your flight plan, maybe you do it in an FMS in another plane. Then you want to go to your X-Plane 10 folder. Go to Output, go to FMS Plans, and go to KLN90B. You can drop those flight plans in here, and each one of these numbers represents the number that's down here. Our flight plan today is actually number four. So if we were actually skip like this to the one we're at, we could actually go like this, press Use, and it automatically preloads everything ready to go, which is very, very helpful. And it's actually going to help kind of pay attention to how good our trip is today. By the way, a really neat function on here is uh, when you have flight plan mode selected, you can actually come over here and skip to uh, the DT page. And this will actually tell you exactly what the tracks are going to be. It'll tell you how long it's going to take to get there. It'll tell you what time you're going to get there. It even keeps track of what time we've departed, how long our flight is, how long it's going to take us. It's really, really cool because if you make changes here, you can double check over here to actually see them adjust. So very, very powerful unit. By the way, notice we're on flight plan zero. Um, if you're doing arrival procedures, we're going to do that a little later on, and I'll show you exactly how to do that. But we're not actually going to do it in this page. We're going to do it in a separate page. And then last but not least, it flips us back to the navigation. Nav 1 is your standard information here. It gives us our distance, ground speed, ETE, bearing, useful information like that. Nav page 2 tells us where we are. Um, we have a little bit of information here. It's just uh, little things. MSA and ESA refers to your minimum safe altitudes. As a general rule, we probably want to be staying above 5,100 feet just for safety. Uh, we have information about VNAV, should we desire. And of course, we have everybody's favorite little moving map in uh, glorious 1980s graphics, even though this is a 1990s unit, as I remember. Um, if you want to change the way this looks, by the way, you just come over here and press the cursor button, and then you can go ahead and set it to exactly the way you want to do it. Personally, I like it in track mode or heading mode, but it's completely up to you. Some people really like north up mode, I don't care for that. If you wanted to switch, by the way, viewing distance, we could set it down to, say, 25 uh, nautical miles, not kilometers. Just like that, we could shut off cursor mode. Now, Nav 5 is actually has a really, really neat little thing. Because if you come over to here to this side of the unit, and you skip to the Nav page, and you take yourself to Nav 5 here, it gives you the big moving map view, which is incredibly useful. You can actually come in here and tweak stuff by pressing the cursor button. You could actually go ahead and, say, scroll down here. You could set this to bearing. You could set what radiology you're tracking on, all this other really, really useful information there. You could even come up here and change it from ETE to uh, cross track, vertical nav, and everything along those lines as well. Now, if you push the cursor button on this side, you can actually tell you what you want to have view on the right. You can turn uh, VORs on, things along those lines. Very, very useful. You could set NDBs on, you could set airport, and you could even change the view again. I'm a fan of kind of heading up, but that's just me. And you click that to shut it. You're going to find that you're going to be spending a lot of time on this page or Personally, I like to kind of do something like this, where you have where you're going, how off you are, and kind of have this information on this side. So that's the left side of the unit. The right side of the unit basically gives us all these little pages here. You have the navigation page, you have airport information. This is going to be really important, and I'll show you why. I'm actually going to go ahead and dial in where we're going. We're going to KBGR. K B. I wonder how much uh, jet fuel I've burnt just sitting here. Whoopsies. Mm, do, 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 do. Enter. And it can actually shut off cursor mode, and here we go. Now check this out. It gives us our northwest, our latitude, longitude. If we go over here, it tells us our elevation. It tells us that it's ILS capable. It also tells us their time correction. It's Zulu minus five hours. It gives us a picture of the airport. We're going to be arriving at 1.5 today. It tells us a little bit about those primary runways. We have 1,000, wow, 11,440 feet. It's quite a bit. Gives us our ATIS frequencies, which you should probably go ahead and dial up there so we actually just kind of have them while we're thinking about it. Just like anything, helps to be prepared. And go ahead and set that to 75. Looks good to me. Go ahead and scoot over to uh, more information. And now this is very important. If you had a SID or a STAR at this particular airport, which unfortunately we don't have in this particular database, you could actually go through these little knobs here and load it directly into your flight plan. But unfortunately, we're not going to have that for this particular airport. Oh, there we go. We do have some uh, instrument approaches, but we have no SID stars. Aren't I an awful person? Hit cursor. Go ahead and scroll down. 
if you remember, we're based not quite VOR15, but uh, pretty darn close to it. So I could press enter. I could select exactly um, if I wanted to load an yeah, outdated database. Yeah, you're going to get all sorts of wonderful warnings here. But it's just something to kind of keep an eye out for if you are a little more organized than I am. Which I'm actually going to clear this all out because we're going to be flying it manually anyway. Yikes. So again, that's where you'd find your approach procedures and things along those lines. You have VOR information, NTP information, intersection. You have um, some other items as well if you had some user stuff in here. If we went ahead, we actually don't get this information, unfortunately. Some references. We have information about our current position, speed, our active waypoints. And then we have the distance time, which I showed you guys a little bit earlier, to kind of tell us how far away it's going to take to get to that destination. We also have all our trip information, which you'll see actually update once we get in the air. So that's pretty much it for this particular unit. We'll see a little bit more once we do get in the air. Anyway, we've got a flight to do. Ah, okay, yes, I'm sorry, passengers. We're rolling, we're rolling. My bad, my bad. All right, let's get rolling. So our runway for taking off is going to be right here on our right, which is pretty convenient, pretty close. Hopefully the weather isn't too, too bad today. Now, don't forget, we are using the NVU for the first part of this flight, and it has not been activated yet. We're actually going to wait on that, and so we're pretty much on the runway. We don't want to be calculating our <laughs> ground right now. It's actually a minimum speed on the unit before it starts calculating. Go ahead and flip on the landing lights so we're good to go. Go ahead and kind of spin around like this. We're going to be cruising at 6,500 meters, by the way, today, in case anybody's curious. Roll ourselves onto the runway here. There we are. Ooh, this is a pretty short runway, but I think we'll be all right. All right, go ahead and engage the parking brakes. We're going to reach down here. We're going to turn on the calculator. Double check to make sure we're set to uh, five n kilometers away. We are. So I'm going to go ahead and activate NVU. Ooh. Calculate on. NVU on. Uh oh. Oh, it's working. I'm just being silly. All right. Let's go ahead and get rolling. Go ahead and slap that guy closed. Let's rock. Thing looks good over there. Uh, after takeoff, looks like we're going to be taking a very gentle left turn. Uh, let's rotate. Nice. Now, when you're using the NVU, it's very, very critical that you do not tip the plane too far up or the Doppler is going to lose sight of the ground. You're going to get all sorts of awful problems. So be very, very careful with that. We are set to NVU. Good. All right. Looks pretty good from now. We're going to go ahead and take our left turn. We're going to start flying towards the NVU position. Again, don't tilt the plane too much. You're going to have some real problems. There we go. Go ahead and shut our landing gear off. Flaps are up. Whoop, tilting a little too much. Let's go ahead and see if our NVU unit is calculating properly. Yep. Good. Tilting a little too much again. And you can see we're already quite a bit off course in our NVU unit because of the fact that um, our course is actually going to be over there towards our left, if you remember from uh, when we were looking at Sky Vector a little earlier. Pitch up just a little more. I don't want to pitch up too much. We're going a little fast, but that's okay because this is just demonstration purposes. Go ahead and reduce power a little bit. Go ahead and bring in our landing lights. and continue that nice gentle turn to the left. Now you can slave the NVU directly into the navigation system, which is what we're going to do in a second. Ah, that was my mistake. Make sure the landing switch isn't on, guys. I'm not a fan of editing, so sorry, I'm not going to go back and fix it. <laughs> now everything's working perfectly. All right, we're going a little fast for this altitude, but um, 
hopefully the FAA isn't paying attention. Go ahead and spin us around. That's looking real good. I'm actually going to go ahead and lock in the stability mode. There we go. And now the NVU is cooking away. So you can see this is our distance to our next point. And then we're actually going to activate the second course once we get there. All right, we are climbing now. You can see that we're getting a nice CD, a course deviation indication here, which actually tells us we're slightly off to the right, which if you actually look at the uh, local map here, the global map, if I zoom out just a little bit, you can see it's pretty much exactly what we intended to do so far. So things are actually working fairly well for us today. All right, we're about to cross 3,000 meters, which is when we can start our acceleration. All right, going to go ahead and start accelerating. There we are. In just a minute, the entire plane is going to take a nice gentle banking right turn. Distance to our place is going to be 11 kilometers. Once this hits 5 kilometers, a little light's going to come on to tell us we're changing course. And then we're going to flip to the other course that we had set up a little bit earlier, if you guys remember. That was the one that was uh, 86 degrees. Once we finish up with that course, we'll actually disengage from the NVU and we'll go ahead and use the global positioning system to take us on the rest of our flight. Very handy. By the way, this is going to be very difficult to use accurately if you've not set up your angles and all your latitude corrections for all your different units. There we go. So now we're pretty much on course. In just a minute, we're probably going to go ahead and flick over to the other course. Oh, there it goes. So you can see I'm getting the changing course and it automatically updated. Now I'm going to pause for just a second here. If we wanted to go ahead and enter our next angle, this would be the time to dial in the 55 degrees into the unit that has not been highlighted since we switched over to this one. Unfortunately, we can't do that while the game is paused, so we didn't really give ourselves a lot of time to do that. But um, it'll be fine. If we work fast enough. All right. So that distance is 26 nautical miles. 26 nautical miles is 48.152. Notice I'm still in SP mode. I'm going to have to work very fast. What did we say it was? 48.152? We're setting it down here, by the way, not up here. Don't make that mistake. Got it. Whoa, how's that for quick work? So now we're actually going to switch over after we finish our short little jaunt here and lock ourselves onto the next part of our course. That is some fancy, fancy work right there. So um, when you are doing this, you probably want to give yourselves a little bit more space between your different positions. In case anybody wants to kind of see it from above, we'll go ahead and go back to this map. You can see, uh, go ahead and switch to high speed mode so you guys can take a better look. If we set ourselves to fixes, you can see there's Rayme, and we're heading directly towards Peaport, and then we're going to take our left turn. Again, we're completely using the NVU system by pre-programming our angle as well as our distance. All right, let's take a look. By the way, you'll never need to leave SP mode unless you need to make left or right corrections. So for example, if I wanted to travel a kilometer to the right of uh, the course that I have up here, I could actually set this to ZP mode, dial in a negative kilometer, and that would make my plane turn towards the right. It's pretty handy. By the way, you'll notice we just switched over to our next course, and now we're back on system one, and we are now traveling. But like I promised a minute ago, we are more interested in working with the GPS at this point. I'm just going to let the NVU kind of flip us around and get us all nice and lined up. All right, let's go ahead and grab our GPS here. By the way, you'll find this kind of interesting. Um, the GPS has been following the same course we have. Notice this information has been populated, and you can see we're pretty much right on course as we would expect if we were actually traveling on a real GPS. So anyway, let's go ahead and uh, call it my favorite page, which is uh, navigation page number five here. And now we're going to slay the aircraft's navigational system into the GPS. To do that, you need to go ahead and activate about these 20. Oh, just kidding, it's just a switch. Ding! Now we're on GPS mode. The NVU is going to keep cooking away just to kind of see the uh, differences between the two units. Um, if I needed to do a direct two way point, for example, you can always press this D with a line through it, dial exactly where we want to go, and kind of away we go. And we should be good to go. I'm actually going to clear that out because we don't care about that right now. There we are. Woo! 
drink some heavy clouds there. The GPS is very accurate. Even if this instrument starts to drift, the GPS will still provide you with correct turning information and things along those lines. I can see that we've just totally missed our altitude that we were supposed to be traveling at. And now we are good to go. So you can see this gives us, if we were to go ahead and flip back to our flight plan page, if we wanted to give an estimate of what time we actually going to get there, we could come over here like this. I'm going to go ahead and activate the very, very, very naughty speed hold control, even though we're not supposed to. Nobody saw that. We want to actually a slightly higher speed than that. Uh, let's do about 500 kilometers an hour. Perfect. We also want to make sure we reset all our altimeters. Uh, oh, that was in an altimeter switch. Okay, good. So now if we come up here and we flip this over to DT mode, it actually will give us an estimate of how long it's going to take to get to each one of those positions. Like right now, our total distance to Bangor, Maine is 145 uh, nautical miles. It's not going to be kilometers an hour. If we switch to this page right here, you can see we left the ground at 1428 and that our total time, uh, I just could say our current time is 1437. Estimated time of arrival is going to be 1459. Our flight time so far has been eight minutes. We have 22 miles to go. Now, switching really, really briefly. Yeah, we're going a little slow, but that's okay. Switching really, really briefly back to here. We're going to be using the high LS approach, which means we're going to have to fly um, the 46 radial from Kennebunk at flight level 180 directly to Brady. Then we're going to be taking a heck of a dive from 12,000 feet all the way down to 2,100 feet. So we're actually going to set up our VOR system now. So we're going to be using the 46 radial. There's two parts to the VOR system on this particular airplane. The first part is the actual unit, and then the second part is setting the correct, um, basically, I guess you would call this radial in here, as well as the radial you want the autopilot to follow in here. So in this particular case, it's going to be 046. Go ahead and dial that to 046, just like that. I'm going to scoot over here. We can't do this just yet, but we would need to look up the um, ENE. The frequency of the ENE is 117.10. Scroll up here to 117.10. And we're supposed to be doing this at 1,800 feet. Let's double check to see it. We are just about to pass it. Once we do pass it, we'll actually go ahead. We can go ahead and hit one of those buttons so you can see where it is. It's just ahead of us. Once we pass it, we will slave ourselves onto it to actually get us going towards that high LS approach. We'll also descend to 1,800 feet. Oh, oh, there it goes. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch it to VOR mode. Oh, returning just like we expected. VOR mode. Set this to 46. Otherwise, you're going to have all sorts of fun problems trying to follow it. And there we go. So now we've seen the NVU, we've seen the GPS, and now it's time to actually fly this thing to victory. You can see we're going ahead and get there. I'm going to start my descent a little early. Go ahead and shut that unit off, because we really, really need to get ourselves down to 1,800, uh, one, flight level 180, rather, because this is all going to happen very, very quickly. In case you're curious how many meters that is, if you go over to the engineer's page and you go over here, you can see that flight level 180 was 5,500 meters. So I'd go ahead and give myself a warning here at 5,500 meters. I'm going to go ahead and start my nice gentle descent down there. Now we're at 12 kilometers away. I'm actually going to flip it over to mi nautical miles mode. Come on, there we go. The reason for that is, is we know what this distance is and it's a little bit easier to do that stuff with it. And now from here, we're just gonna kinda take a nice and easy flight. I'm gonna go ahead and grab my GPS real quick. These waypoint 01 and waypoint 02, by the way, are the top of climb and top of descent respectively. We're not worrying about that at this point because again, this is gonna be a pretty easy flight for us. Can, oh, look at that, it's directly behind us. So theoretically, uh, everything should be working fairly well. I'm going to start thinking about setting up the, I the high ILS as well. Now, one thing you got to watch out for on this aircraft, you can only fly ILS on the left system. So that's something you want to kind of watch out for that you don't accidentally miss. Otherwise, you're going to have all sorts of problems when uh, you're trying to set yourself up. That being said, you can always use VORs from the left or from the right, depending on how you want to set things up. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to set that VOR on that side up just like this 
Go ahead and dial that one in as well. 46 degrees. There we are. Now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to lock it on to VOR2. Nothing should have changed because it's the same frequency and same heading as we had a minute ago. The reason I'm doing that is that gives me a free VOR receiver so I can go ahead and dial in the localizer at 109.50. 109, 50. 109 50, I think we're just about to our altitude, aren't we? 109.50, perfect. And that's going to be important for us in a minute. I'm going to leave myself a quick note. Uh, what do we have? 157, I think it is. 157. That's going to be very important a little later on. I'm going to go ahead and level off right up at 5,500 meters. Again, I'd want to go ahead and change my settings for Q and H and stuff like that at this point, but I'm going to wait on it for just a minute till we get a little closer to Bangor. There's my warning. By the way, our NVU is still calculating away. Theoretically, it should more or less agree with us when we get to our particular point. I always like to pause when I get to the altitude that I desire. You'll see that in a second because it just makes it easier to mash that button at exactly the right altitude. There we go. Go ahead and bring my power back up. We are in great shape. There's our distance from that point right there, which is pretty good. We'll go dial in here real quick. Brady, we should be crossing Brady at 12,000. So if our current altitude is 18,000, we need to give up 6,000 feet. Uh, six times three is 18. So when we get to 18 nautical miles away from this, whoop, away from this point, we're gonna have to start our descent down. We're also, it looks like there's a speed restriction there of 265 knots. We're going to kind of keep that in the back of our head as well. So you can see we're 50 nautical miles away from uh, Kennebunk. And we need to go ahead and do some quick math. So if we need to be, give up 6,000 feet, that's going to be 18 nautical miles away, minus 118. Oh, whoop, getting an overspeed warning. Go ahead and slow down a little bit. Yeah, we did get a little carried away, didn't we? So when this is 100, we're going to have to start our descent down to our desired height. I'm actually going to go ahead and slow down a little more. We're going real fast. Uh, got it. Set. Okay. So when this is 100, that would tell us that we're 18 nautical miles away from Brady, which is going to be the time that we have to start descending down to 12,000 feet as indicated right here. What are our minimums? 200, that's 60 meters. Got it. All right, we're in great shape. Now we just kind of chill. Taking a look at our ILS real quick for a second. I'm going to go ahead and flip back to the nav page. Ah, uh, yes, you can see if uh, we're going to be doing a direct two-way point in just a second. If I switch both pages to nav five. Oh, we're actually pretty much right on course, even though we're using a different navigational system for each part of this trip. It's pretty cool if you ask me. It actually says we're about two nautical miles away from the uh, top of descent anyway, but that's all right. Two minutes rather than nautical miles. All right, we have 30 nautical miles to go. I'm just gonna come run over here real quick, make sure everything is looking the way it is. Good, we've got plenty of fuel, everything's looking good. We have a little warning light on the emergency brake. Go ahead and charge that guy back up. Let's see, everybody in the back of the airplane can breathe just fine, which is convenient. And everything up here looks like it's actually doing really, really well at this point. So again, I'm just watching this really, really, really carefully. Uh, one quick tip, too, is it's not a bad idea to uh, use the course option to lock on to whatever heading the plane is currently going. We're getting the change course warning, by the way, because we exceeded our little distance there to our next point. But since we're not using it anymore, I'm going to go ahead and click it off. But uh, we can always go back to this if we needed to. Um, some people may be interested in using the NVU system to travel long distances across the water. Uh, that's wonderful, but you have to remember that you have a magnetic gyro in here and a directional gyro, and that is not going to automatically correct for changes in latitude and magnetic deviation and precession. 
The other thing you have to remember is that you're traveling, if you're going long distances, what they call great circle courses. And because of that, this unit, if I were to dial in the angle for England, for example, would actually take me terribly off course before I actually got to it. That requires some pretty heavy math to dial into this particular unit in order to get it working. The good news is that on the explain.org forums, there actually is a thing that will go ahead and assist you with um, doing the math for that if you're so inclined. All right, we're at 91.4. I'm actually going to shut speed mode off, and I'm going to let this thing kind of come down a little bit because uh, we're going to begin our descent in just a moment. Again, our goal is going to be... Uh, let's go ahead and take a look over here. Our goal is going to be 12,000 feet, which is going to be 3650. I'm going to go ahead and dial this in real quick. It's just a little note for me. 3600 looks good to me. Stand by for descent. And doesn't hurt to be early, right? Five and a quarter. Down we go. Okay, so here's what's going on. We're presently exactly 18 nautical miles away from Brady, which is 25 nautical miles away from Bangor. We could actually dial in that VOR at this point if we wanted to. We're going to be executing a pretty tight turn right in here to try to get lined up with this. We're not going to be 100% sure with this until we get a little closer. And you can see we can actually dial that in first if we want to, if we're a little concerned. I'm actually going to do that just because it gives us a little bit better reach than an ILS might have. Okay. That's good. Oh, look at that. Now we're getting a reading. Good. So that is going to be 157, and it looks like we do a little juke and line ourselves up to 151 once we're at 14.3 nautical miles away. Not bad. Ah, entering Maine. Very nice. Very nice camping up there. Anyway, let's pay attention. We're going for 12,000 feet, if you remember from earlier distance to that point. When this is 118, theoretically, we should be roughly at... Oh! Oh! Nice catch, everybody. Nice catch. Oh, boy. This is one of the uh, classic dangers, by the way, of operating aircraft from other countries. We are quite a bit early for our descent. Very early, actually. Oh, look at that. We're actually getting our uh, 2 9 or 9 or 8. I'm just going to remember that. Everything's happening at once. Every oh, my God. No, we're fine. So um, one thing you do have to watch out for is if you're in miles, use miles. If you're in kilometers, use kilometers. You can see we're about 40 early. And uh, I'm going to cheat in just a minute to kind of fast forward things to get us a little bit kind of closer down the line. I'm going to wait until we get down to our 12,000 first. So make sure you guys, if you're working in miles, you're working in miles. If you're working in kilometers, you're working in kilometers. Learn from my mistake, which the whole world just got to get on tape. Anyway, uh, we just got information that it said that the altimeter is 2998, so we might as well get that all set up while we're at it. Go to convert, switch to inches mercury, we're doing 2998, which gets us 1015 HPA, we're already at 1015. Coming down here at 761. Come over here, 1015, it's already at 761. That was convenient. Close that. 14,000 feet, we're moving pretty quick here. One thing we're going to have to calculate, though, is since we're going to be going 265 knots, we need to figure out what that is in kph. Convert 265 knots to kph. That's 490 is going to be our speed once we get to that point. 13,600. So now when we wanted this to say 118 is when we'd be doing our turn. Instead, we're going to be waiting, or I should say I'm going to be fast-forwarding in a second. Instead... We're going to be looking out for 25 on this, which you can see is a pretty hefty distance from here. Anyway, let's go ahead and get ourselves down a little bit lower. Again, we could be scooting over here to our GPS. It probably wouldn't have hurt to pay a little more attention to it. But you can see we've drifted off course a little bit because, again, we're using a radio system as opposed to a GPS, which is going to be a little less accurate. All right, we're almost down to 12,000. And then I'm going to let us slow down to our approach speed. Oh, there's our warning. Awesome. Now I'm going to get us down to our 490 knots also before engaging the speed hold, which I know is you're not supposed to do it, but 
Hopefully Felis isn't watching. There we are. Let's wait until we get everything all nice and balanced out and smooth. And then we're going to fast forward. Although we're really not that far off, but we're far off enough that it counts. Wait until everything's nice and stabilized. Alright, Operation Cheat. Haha. <laughs> Let's see here. Nobody saw nothing. Oh, look at that. We happen to be just about 25 away. So I'm going to go ahead and pause things. Since we're 25 away, we're going to dial into the VOR of Bangor to help us get kind of set up for the ILS. It's going to be 157 degrees. I'm going to reach down here, set this to VOR number one. If you remember, we already dialed in Bangor's uh, position right here. We've already set it down. Oh, no, we didn't set it down here. That would have been bad. Very bad. 157. Set this guy over here to one, oh, 157 also. And now we're going to have to execute our military style descent. Checked. Checked. Shut that off. We're actually going to go ahead and hit this button a couple times. And down we go. Go ahead and shut off the speed hold. Descent. All right, here we go. So we're going to be executing a fairly tight right turn here. Now the important thing here is going to be paying attention to our distance. We know we're in nautical miles this time, so we should be a lot safer. Once we get to 14.3 nautical miles in about, looks like about 5,000, between 3 and 5,000 feet up, we're going to have to switch our channel to 109.50 and then take a quick little juke to the right to kind of line ourselves up with what's going on. All right, here we go. 22 nautical miles, if you want to look at it from an overhead view. You can see how we're getting ourselves kind of set up. And right, everything's looking pretty good now. Slowing down, bringing a little speed brakes to help slow us down a bit. Nice, here we go. 19.4. Whoa. Turbulence. Eighteen point three nautical miles. Looks like we might just be able to slave ourselves right into the ILS anyway. It's going to be a pretty steep approach here. Crossing under 10,000 feet. Keep those speed brakes out because we're going to be coming in pretty aggressively. Let's go ahead and take a look at our approach speeds. Approach speeds are going to be 250 kilometers an hour. We're within 14.8 now, so we should be able to actually dial in the ILS, which is going to be 109.50. 109.50, it's going to be 153 degrees, I believe, 151. 151. Set this to 151. Now we are good to go. You can see we're quite a bit high. Our airport should be right off to the right, which it is. Alright. Let's see here. At 13.8, we should be about 3,000 feet up. We're pretty high. <laughs> good thing we have speed brakes. And of course, we're going to have to slow down for the actual approach itself. All right, I'm going to ease off the speed brakes just a little bit. 
Don't forget to check your stabilizer setting at this point, which is set pretty well. I'm going to go ahead and have my engineer shut off the engine bleed valves. All right, just a moment, we're going to be swinging pretty hard to the right as we approach. 14.2. At 13.8, we're supposed to be at 3,000. We're at 5,000, so I'm going to go ahead and slow ourselves down. At 7.8, we're supposed to be at 2,100 feet, which I think we're going to make pretty well today. Landing set, HZ set. You can actually take a look at our KLN. Now we're just about on the correct course here. So everything's actually worked out pretty well. All right, here we go. There's our runway right there. Start slowing down here. Let's see, at 7.8, we should be at 2,100 feet. We're at 2,850. So we're not doing too bad. Slow down to about 300. Gear down. All right, everything is looking pretty good. We're a little high. I'm not too concerned with that because I'm just going to land the plane anyway. And there you have it, an NVU plus KLN90 tutorial. With a little bit of craziness in the middle. We basically uh, skip most of the correct version of the procedure to kind of swing ourselves around sort of high. We go ahead and uh, glide slope that because it seems we're awfully high. But at the end, we still got ourselves directly to the intended airport. Don't forget, by the way, that you guys probably want to make sure that your um, Q&H, as well as your latitude corrections and things like that, are all preset prior to approaching one of these runways to make sure everything works pretty well. But at the very least, you got to kind of see a little bit of uh, what you'd expect from a high LS approach. You can see we're a little low. Automatic throttle's catching in. All right, I think we're going to make it just fine today. Glide slope. Glide slope. 500. All right, we're going to wait for minimums. That's close enough, I think. Two hundred. One thing I can never get at the hang of with this plane is um, when you cut the throttle, instead of going up, it goes down. Nice. Alright guys, I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. 
don't make the same mistakes I did as far as kilometers and nautical miles. I was wondering why those things are going by so far. But that's basically it. Keep an eye out for units. Make sure you don't do anything too, too crazy as far as uh, demands. Make sure you give yourselves plenty of room for those turns. Don't forget to turn the turns on. Uh, the GPS, by the way, is a wonderful, wonderful unit. It works best in flight plan mode, but you can always press the D with the arrow to it and give it a specific thing that you'd like to take yourself to. So um, that's the conclusion of the tutorial. I hope you guys have enjoyed.